Hello everyone, my name is Basim Youssef and I'm live from Fusion headquarters in New York. So um, we are going to talk today about uh, Democracy Handbook and we can ask me anything. So let's begin. All right, should we do it? All right, first question. Uh, tell us about Democracy Handbook. When is it coming out? So Democracy Handbook is going to be released on the 14th of July. So it's like on a Thursday, it's not a weekend, so you can watch it live. Uh, is, is live the right word? Oh, it's digital, so it's gonna be there. And 17th of July, it's gonna be the television special. Um, second question, what's the most surprising thing you've learned about democracy in America? Mm, all right, so it's, it's not more of a surprising, it's more of a seeing it in action. It's like how democracy could be uh, swayed by um, special interest and uh, uh, that was very apparent in the uh, in the Congress a couple of weeks ago when the, there was a law or a regulation or a bill supposed to pass about guns and it didn't pass because the majority of the uh, Congress is basically receiving uh, money from uh, the uh, NRA. So. That was pretty much in your face. It's like, we are not going to pass this bill, which is supposed to be beneficial for the American public because we are on a payroll. So that was like that. It's like, here guys, we are not ashamed of being bought up, so screw you. Um, what's better, a shitty and limited democracy that provides some uh, semblance of stability or the chaos of an unbridled democracy? So this is a very, sneaky question because basically what you're saying here that a democracy produces chaos and uh, a, a, some sort of a dictatorship uh, would produce stability. That is not the case because you can, if you go to um, Europe, um, Scandinavian countries, which I know that you guys don't like to uh, reference them as being an evil socialist uh, <laughs> democracies, um, I, no, you can, you, can ha you can still have uh, stability and you can have democracy. Uh, this is the kind of excuses that many, um, um, many uh, dictatorships in the world would, um, would tell their, their people that we should not have democracy because it will produce chaos. Uh, the other side of democracy is justice. Democracy, justice, equality. So it's, uh, democracy basically be, should provide all three, not just the, the ability to, uh, to speak up. So that is quite the uneducated uh, version of my answer. So, um, all right, so uh, I have a question now. What was the most awkward moment during the shooting of the show? So I went to this uh, uh, gun shop uh, in Orlando near Orlando and uh, the guy was basically um, a racist who hates Arabs and Muslims and I was there uh, having the whole interview with him not knowing that I am a Muslim or an Arab and he was saying the most degrading racist comments against uh, uh, Arabs and Muslims and I had to stay there and smile just to get through the interview so that was weird um, if Trump was in front of you right now, what would you do or say to him? I would uh, give him the, like, the cat eye, kitty eye, and say, do you want to like, deport me? See, here's the police coming to get me. It's gone. All right. Hopefully they're not coming to get me, right? Okay. Uh, dear Basim, do you think that sarcasm could help to change American government activities in Egypt or even in the Middle East? <laughs> well, I tried that. Didn't work. Okay, if you could live in any decade in any country in history, you, okay, if you could live... All right, so... All right, they're not giving way to this guy or maybe Trump is coming to get me. So, if you could live in any decade in any country in history, which, could, which would you choose? The 20s in America? Actually, I would, I would choose the 1960s. That was fun. I think it's beautiful. And I, and I love the way people dress there. It's, it's very nice. And kind of like right before junk food would kick in. But 
otherwise. So, uh, my question is, which is easier, being a surgeon or being a satirist? Well, if you are a surgeon and you mess up, um, it is not going to be as uh, daunting as a satirist because basically you're in front of everybody. So, I guess being a surgeon. All right, question coming in. What, well, what do you want to say for your fans that really missed your show and find life in Egypt hard without your sarcasm? Uh, oh, that is so sweet. Well, I say that I miss them too, but it's out of my hands and I would uh, have loved to be back. But, you know, there's a reason why I'm not there. Did you ever consider running for the president of Egypt? <laughs> no. Uh, have you learned any new dance moves in America? Will you show us? Well, I have learned how to hula hoop, which I don't know if it would uh, qualify as a dance move, uh, thanks to uh, the wonderful Lisa Rudin from Fusion in LA. And uh, uh, I don't have a hula hoop right now, so I'm off the hook. Okay. Um, all right. Who are your role models? Who inspires you? Uh, <clears throat> well, I guess John Stewart comes always as number one. And uh, um, <clears throat> I like uh, John Oliver, so it seems that all of them are comedians. And uh, maybe Superman. I know it doesn't fit, but yeah. Um, what solution do you possibly have for adolescent obesity in U.S.? Plant-based diet. Plant-based diet. Plant-based diet. Not veganism. Plant-based diet because some vegans, like as much as they are great and everything, but they have unhealthy food choices. So plant-based diet, whole food diet, things that are minimally processed, uh, no animal protein and products, no sugar, and uh, no fake uh, food, fake meat, fake cheese. Yes, plant-based diet. Yes. Uh, how can Arab Americans fight xenophobia in the U.S.? I think one thing that they can do is like to put themselves out there and not to be afraid of making fun of their their own problems. Because you know we're we have our own set of problems. Uh, you know Arab Americans. Muslim Americans in America are not the same, are not like one thing. We are maybe 3% of the population and uh, within this population we have a lot of our differences and a lot of our um, xenophobic problems within each other. So maybe if we can, uh, uh, you know, have the courage to actually make fun of that too. And, you know, because like if you look for example at other minorities, uh, you know, black Americans or, uh, or Hispanics or, or Jewish uh, minorities, they, they, they have no problem making fun of, of their culture and uh, their beliefs. Uh, and, and I think if we do that, maybe it would be, uh, we would consider, like, because a lot, there's a lot of people saying, like, oh, you people don't laugh, don't make fun. And, and I think it, there's a lot of comedians, Arab comedians and Muslim comedians there who uh, want to st to break uh, these stereotypes and they have a pushback from their own community so I think this is the way to go all right do you think it's more dangerous in Egypt or in the United States uh, it depends on what you say I think you can get away with what you say uh, about American politics if you are in Egypt and vice versa so depends on your point of view uh, all right, another one. A few months ago on Fusion Comedy, you learned how to hula hoop. What dance moves are you going to learn next? I want to pop. Like, yes. Like, pop, boom, boom. Yeah, I want to do popping next. I need to find someone to teach me popping. All right. Um, all right, do you think a plant-based diet will ever become popular in America? Well, you know, looking at all of these salad places in, in, uh, in New York, there's like a salad bar every single uh, uh, corner here in New York. And I, I, maybe it will catch up. I think if they have the, uh, the same amount of support and money, maybe they can push it and, and, and tell people that plant-based is not just 
green leaves, there are very beautiful options out there. All right, uh, was the Arab Spring productive or was it an unfulfilled dream? I know that it uh, looks very uh, disappointing right now, but it is a process. Uh, I'm sure that somewhere in the French Revolution or the American Revolution or any other revolution across history, it, it didn't pay off after a couple of years. As a matter of fact, it took decades. And, um, you know, even like a hundred and something years after the American Revolution, there was a civil war. Uh, and the, it took maybe like um, maybe a century, a century and a half for the French Revolution to actually to be fulfilled. Uh, it is a struggle and I think it's the beginning. And, um, you know, at least we started. All right. In, is there an American politician who surprised you during this election, good or bad? Yes, uh, Bernie Sanders. Uh, at, when he announced, I mean, because I thought that this would be a slam dunk, very easy, right, for Hillary Clinton. When he announced, like, I, I had no idea who this guy was. And it's like, oh, well, you, why is he this guy wasting time? And I have to say, I was surprised, pleasantly surprised. He's a great candidate. And um, I wish that he was the nominee. But, you know, I'm not even a citizen, so... I don't have a say in that. Uh, do you think uh, education and culture of the population are affecting the success, success of democracy? Of course, but education is not everything. I mean, you could be educated by, but totally stupid. I mean, you can have all the degrees and, and the, the world the experience in the world, but you can still be a bigot or a racist. And we can see that in the... Uh, in many places of the world, basically, a lot of people who could be uh, have uh, went to the best schools, went to the uh, have the you know pretty much exposed, uh, and they're still uh, driving um, a very racist and, and xenophobic um, uh, narrative. So, yes, of course, it's important, but it's not everything. You need to make maybe have a degree in humanity. That's that will solve it. What do you think will happen with the right wing rise in politics? I think it's very disturbing. It's not just in America, it's everywhere. If you look at the Middle East uh, and if you look at the Europe, uh, there's a rise of right wing. And uh, the worst thing about that is that, first of all, they are helping each other and they are feeding off each other. So uh, one hate message here is propagated. It will uh, cause a reaction on the other side. and. Uh, that uh, doesn't look very promising or comforting to have these uh, right-wing narratives everywhere. It's like too much hate in the world now. Um, what is your favorite amendment of the U.S. Constitution? First amendment, of course, free speech. And which amendment is most overrated? Second amendment, of course. Uh, underrated, these are the only two amendments I know, so I don't know what's going on with the rest of your constitution. Uh, after Brexit, how would Arabs and other minorities cope up with that in the UK? Well, uh, I have to say that it was very disturbing what happened after Brexit. It's uh, especially not just with the Arabs. I mean, look what happened to the Polish and uh, uh, po uh, Polish minorities in the uh, in the UK. I think that something like Brexit gives a voice to um, a lot of xenophobic and racist voices, and. Um, Hate, ignorance, and xenophobia works hand in hand together, and the results might not be very good. And again, the way that they co uh, cope. Uh, all right, so kind of maybe I'll sidetrack a little bit. This is the thing about Arab minorities and Muslim minorities. I think, of course, there's a lot of hate and xenophobia, but also I think there's a lot that Arab minorities can do is to assimilate themselves more. They're, the young people, the young generation, are doing a great job doing that, but. There's a lot of people who are kind of like locking themselves in and are not getting into the mainstream. They, we, we've seen, we, and it's not just like Arabs and Muslims. There are other uh, religious groups from other places who think that they are too good to be assimilated, that uh, being assimilated into the, uh, uh, into the culture would affect or, destroy or, uh, or undermine their identity. And the problem with identity is that it is the same exact narrative that the right wing always uses, like they're going to take away our identity. Your identity is not going to go anywhere. You can still be assimilated and preserve whatever beliefs that you have. So uh, maybe we should uh, do more 
of that. Um, what is your message to Syrians? I mean, like, you know, the Syrians are really getting the worst deal out of anything. I mean, they are, they can't stay at their home, and when they leave, they're not welcomed. And I, I am sure that Syrians are not big fans of leaving their homes and villages and cities and become refugees. And, you know, they, they're they being bombed out of their countries and they're being, uh, you know, bashed out of their, uh, of other countries, you know, just like, uh, it seems that like the whole world just like conspired to just like make this Syria like a living hell. And I, I my heart goes out for it. And um, hopefully, uh, in the in the near future, future, I would love to uh, connect with some of the Syrian refugees somewhere in the world, and hopefully, maybe it will happen very soon. Uh, what do you think about the gun policy in the U.S. and how hard can it be to undo it? Well, it seems that it. Is, I don't think it is that hard. It's just like it's supported by big money. Uh, and the, it just when you have a special interest group that openly uh, s supports and finance uh, lawmakers and, uh, in, in, the, in the House of Representatives, it's, uh, I, I just like wonder how long this is going to conti uh, continue. Uh, because if you want to talk technically, it's not that just the Second Amendment, because the Second Amendment was very clear that like, at that time, you know, I'm not American, so I don't want to say something that will kind of hang me, but uh, uh, basically it was uh, formulated at a time when the, the, uh, the, uh, the American nation was formed and you needed militias to uh, kind of come to the rescue uh, when the, the, the government needed it and not just like go against the government, but I, I mean, you can keep it, but like, do you really have to give them assault rifles, maybe muskets and uh, little uh, one bullet guns? That will do. You still have guns, so you can still have that. Do you ever miss eating meat or indulge in non-plant-based diet? No, I don't miss the meat. I sometimes miss the cheese. It's hard. And I miss the sugar. It's hard. But uh, every time I eat that, I feel terrible. So I'm, I'm, I'm much, I, I feel much better with when I'm not on, on meat or sugar or cheese. And when I eat them, I have this now, the, this very brief moment of pleasure. And after five minutes, I feel it down in my stomach. How do you think Egyptian youth can remain positive and involved under the current regime? It's tough. It's tough. And I will be the last one to give any advice when I'm outside. But you know, um, the best thing that you can do is just do it, be the best at what you do, you know, because there's going to be a time that the new democracy in Egypt will be needing you, so sorry. Oh. All right, politicians always talk about change. What do you think it takes for actual positive change to take place? Well, I think the, um, that will happen when people are be, become more transparent about who are they being financed from. I mean, I think the biggest problem with uh, standing in the way of change is this become changing from a democracy to an oligarchy. Uh, yes, you can vote and, and, and uh, to anybody that you want, but like if you're being grossly outspent and the money is coming from special interest groups that will block any uh, trial for change, that would be a problem. Uh, has a piece of comedy ever made you change your thinking on an issue? What was it? Oh my God, that's a great question. And Lauder and... Uh, wow. Um, mm, I, can't, I can't think of one piece of comedy, but I would say, you know, George Carlin was always an, an incredible person to, to inspire people. He, he was not a comedian as much of a, an activist with a stand-up mic. So maybe George Carlin. I will, I, I will have to think about that piece of comedy and lauder. Uh, what lessons have you learned from the Egyptian revolution that you think Americans need to know, especially during these turbulent times? Well, injustice is uh, a great catalyst for chaos. It's not stability that will protect, it's, it, stability doesn't come from uh, more security, it, stability comes from justice. And if you don't have justice, 
no matter how uh, how strong you think, it will the injustice will erode into your democratic system. Uh, all right. Um, All right, do you miss practicing medicine? No. <laughs> that was quick. Uh, what are some action points that one can do to build bridges between the Arab world and the U.S.? Maybe uh, include more people into, uh, like, you know, Arabs into drama and media because if, so, if, if a minority is not, is not present, they are either not there or they are different. So maybe have us into uh, more roles than just uh, blowing ourselves up, which, by the way, I'm, I'm practicing, so waiting for the next uh, role as a terrorist. So thank you so much. That was great, and that was a lovely session. And um, so, uh, like, you know, um, stay tuned for Democracy Handbook 14th of July next week. Bye-bye. Subscribe. Like, comment, favorite.